Hello, and welcome back to the Thematic Intelligence podcast. At Global Data's Thematic Intelligence, we track over 100 tech, industry, ESG, and macro themes impacting all major sectors. I'm Isaac. Today, I have with me Zach Mickelson, Senior Director, a digital business consultancy, publicist, sapient, and adjunct professor at NYU's Professional Studies Finance Department. Hi, Zach. How are you doing? Hi. Doing very well. Pleasure to join you, Isaac. Glad to hear it. Right. You ready to talk about crypto? Let's do it. Cryptocurrencies have faced some pretty high-profile lawsuits over the past couple of years, from Sam Bankman frieds November indictment to the ongoing series of securities fraud cases brought by the SEC. Could you begin by laying out exactly what it is about crypto that's drawn the ire of regulators? So regulators like the SEC, for instance, are tasked with protecting the investor marketplace. And... Uh, anything that is an investment uh, device, like a security, they're tasked, at least in the United States, with regulating for the purpose of, of protecting investors. The history here is that in the Great Depression, people lost a lot of money. They were created for the purpose of trying to prevent these situations from happening again. Uh, so as crypto has developed, it sure is looking like an investment asset. People are treating it like an investment asset. They are believing that it's an investment asset. Therefore, the SEC and other regulators who deal with investment assets are saying, this this looks like something that we should be involved in if people are, are thinking that this is an investment asset. And so then uh, really the, the only case that they shouldn't be involved and in regulating it would be the idea that it's not an investment asset. And there's there's some argument for that. Um, if, if, for instance, you say, no, it's just, it's a collectible, right? There are other things that people own that people do ascribe investment value to that nonetheless are not regulated things. A piece of artwork or um, Pokemon cards or anything else, right? Like, th like that, you could say, um, you know, are, are things that people have made money on by owning, but they're not um, they're not securities. And your agency is the Securities and Exchange Commission. We're not a security. But but then you, you get yourself in the situation of saying, you know, so so what are you? You say, well, we're we're like Pokemon cards or or something like that, right? And so, you know, almost having to argue for something that many crypto people kind of don't want to argue for. But as you know, sometimes in law you take the opposite position to what your real beliefs are because it's in the incentive of, of your legal arguments. So, so the basis of, um, the, of the crypto arguments in, in trying to avoid uh, regulators is, is to try to say that they are not many of the things that they have wanted to argue that they are like a store of value and, and uh, you know, an investment asset and, and something that is, uh, an investment asset that's that's readily tradable and liquid because you know, all those sorts of attributes start sounding like you're describing a security, um, you know, rather than like a collectible asset like, um, you know, stamps or rare coins or something like that, you know. Um, so so that's that's been the gist of the argument. Um you know what we've also seen is is other things where people are um, okay facing the regulators by, for instance, the major institutions. The big development this year was the approval of exchange traded funds, and on that you have to recognize, well, okay, so look, if people are willing to play by the rules, how can you not allow them to create that? If people are saying, "I'm willing to create a security," "I'm willing to create uh, a regulated fund." And what I want to put in this fund is this stuff, right? I want to put crypto in there. Well, like what, you know, what difference does it make to you? Like what I put in there. Now they have some answers on what difference it, it makes to them, but there's there's kind of no good answer on why it wasn't this. Like, you know, what, mm -hmm. why can't I put, why can't I put crypto in, in, in my fund? You know, well, okay. It might go up. It might go down in value. Like that's, you know, that's how the world works. You know, you, you, you're not mm. going to let people have funds just because they might go up or down in value. Um, so ultimately, 
uh, it was not a big surprise that 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 ultimately got uh, that ultimately got approved. But there, there's an example of, um, of of people choosing to face the regulators, right? Of people choosing mm -hmm. to you know to play by the rules. Well, I'm really glad that you brought that up, actually, because that was going to be my next question is um, we've seen quite a lot of increased interest from institutions in uh, crypto over the last like year, maybe a couple of years. Um, so obviously, yeah, BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF was a big one, but also stuff like JP Morgan's Crescendo, which is looking at using blockchain without necessarily using crypto to change the way that money gets moved around. Um so could you talk a bit about why suddenly institutions are interested in this sector, especially given that there's, you know, more kind of regulation going on and how their approach maybe differs from some of these more exclusively crypto based firms? To some extent, the involvement of regulators makes it more attractive for the larger institutions. Um, I think, you know, large institutions um, base their monopoly power around barriers to entry. So to some real extent, there's a, a symbiosis in, in finance and, and throughout the world between regulators and the large institutions that they are dealing with, probably nowhere else more than finance, hmm. um, because regulatory action creates a barrier to entry, which ultimately you know, it, is a safeguard against smaller entrants you know, being able to compete, right? So uh, for a JP Morgan or a BlackRock, having some rules of the game, you know, sort of makes it makes it more attractive to them, right? Um, you know, why do billionaires go into Formula One? Because it's very expensive to have a team, right? You know, which prevents mm -hmm. anyone from like non-billionaires from entering <laughs> the world of, owning formula one teams right yeah yeah it's kind of like you know the impact of like having regulators you know for uh you know for for financial institutions it prevents anybody else from joining the game so um as this becomes a more regulated marketplace that that has actually kind of made it more interesting and attractive it it, it is that unregulated aspect that has the knee-jerk reaction for major financial institutions that you know uh, what's in it for us to to participate there, right? Where you know it, anybody from their mom's basement can be competing against us? That's that's not what we're looking for, right? Mm -hmm. JP Morgan doesn't doesn't want to play those games, and so then therefore their messaging needs to be: No, this isn't. This is not serious. This is not. This is not real finance. You, you can't trust that. Mm -hmm. um, and so as there's been regulatory development some rules of the game particularly rules of the game that make it um, more expensive for others to join now you know a blackrock a fidelity a franklin templeton a jp morgan becomes uh becomes more interested to join that said you also mentioned the idea about uh blockchain technology or generally speaking, distributed ledgers mm. being useful as a financial technology, which really is about the idea that uh, distributed ledgers are solving challenges that financial institutions have been working on for decades or in, in some cases, centuries. The idea of how do you do settlement and record keeping and agreement and reduction of error in all of those processes and security and privacy and avoidance of fraud. These are all things that financial institutions have been trying to solve in, in their transactions and in their agreements for, for centuries. Mm. So the development of a technology that makes those things easier problems well, that's that that's attractive broadly um, and and for numerous use cases. And that's particularly something that that we work on. You mentioned we're a digital services consultancy. So we work on problems like that where we're trying to help large financial institutions solve issues about 
implementing technology to to solve solutions and uh, in transactions and security and record keeping in uh, in deploying solutions and customizing them for their own use case or um, operating them privately or any of those sorts of things, which makes DLT or distributed ledger technology something that naturally falls in our strike zone, even if it's not mm. for Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, you know, it, it might just be for utilizing the technology uh, for things like collateral movement or derivatives or um, interbank currency transfers in regular fiat currency or, or you know, that, that, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I guess on exactly that note, you know, that there's one other thing that sits sort of halfway between the traditional crypto and then the big institutional players as a sort of third step, which is central banks. And they are interested in central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. Um, and these seem to be being talked about by every major economy with live tests happening across the globe. Um, could you explain to our listeners what a CBDC is and why it's got central banks and big governments so excited? Right. So <laughs> uh, all the, it, 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 the tricky thing is that not a whole lot of people really kind of understand money to begin with. Uh, so that's... Um, a tricky thing in, in understanding a central bank digital currency is as discussed here because nominally speaking central bank digital currencies already exist that's that's essentially what you know what, what your money already is it's already digital right i mean sure you might have some money in your pocket but that's not what most of your transactions are already with anywhere in the world so then that immediately raises confusion for for the average person. Oh, so so then what are you talking about? Like if if we're already using something that I thought was a central bank digital currency, what does this mean? Well, this is referring to the blockchain version of it, which therefore reveals what is the difference and and to some extent how minor the difference is, at least ostensibly, that. All we're talking about is a different mechanism of record keeping. Now, as it turns out, that different method of record keeping could have some significant implications for everybody involved. So, some good, some potentially concerning, um, and and that I think is that the balance of those potential benefits versus uh potential problems or or areas of concern is what's going to determine the future of it money is just is just credit and it's just a record so that's that's the attractiveness to to the blockchain people they say oh well that's that's what blockchain is it's it's an immutable record that's we, we can do that that's perfect it's this is why it's perfect money some some debate about you know the the word that's doing a lot of work there is perfect but it is at least it is at least record keeping. Um, so, but from that standpoint, you could look at a central bank digital currency as you know as, as an IT upgrade in a way, right? It's just it's modernizing a system that the ECB, that the Fed, that the Bank of England, all all of them already have these systems. At its core, this is sort of the technical discussion that many of the major central banks. Are interested in it about about CBDCs. Um, and, you know, we, we mean the Fed and the ECB are most significantly talking about wholesale CBDC, and and it's really it's a technical discussion about the idea that that this technology could uh, improve collateral velocity and therefore um, make things easier and faster on the major financial institutions when dealing with the central bank or with each other. Well, yeah, I mean, thank you very much for that. That was a really detailed answer. Um, I think that is all that we have time for today. So thank you very much, Zach, for your time and your insights. Thank you. And thank you all very much for listening. And from us and Thematic Intelligence, see you next time.